praise God. We thank God for the privilege to be able to lead you in worship. We are going to read from the book of Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his court with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to, to all generations.
thank you that we're in your house. We honor you, we praise you, we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
says out of the mouths of babes and sucklings the Lord has ordained strength that he may stand against his enemies he doesn't need to send the adults the children have said no to the devil so can you say no to everything that you do not like to see in your life whether it's sickness whether it's pain whether it's defeat whatever it is say no in the name of Jesus can you go ahead declare it with your mouth Lord, we say no to sickness in the name of Jesus. We say no to pain in the name of Jesus. We say no to fear in the name of Jesus. Every work of the devil is destroyed in the name of Jesus. Ilibra makatara boshte, libro kotoro boshta, malabro kotoro boshi kabra katara bosundoro boshi libro kotoro boshte. Invite the power of Jesus into that situation. Maske promosundori makande libro kotoro boshi. The power of God over that situation now. Power, power, power. Belongs to Jesus. Over Grandma Pamela. Over Uncle John. Over Uncle Bob. We release the power of God.
with our mouths we will declare no 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 to the works of Satan sickness and disease be gone we're going to take two minutes two minutes for those who have the prayer language you're going to speak speak to God let, your, let the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you speak speak clearly decree and declare that no to the works of Satan and we invite Jesus into every situation sickness, fear, disease death whatever it is illness we declare, we say today, no, no more, no more. Satan be gone. Over every situation, you reign. You reign over every situation. We thank you. We bless you. We know you have heard us. More of you. When we have more of you, Satan cannot come there. Where there is light, darkness cannot exist. It is impossible. Not possible. So we, we invite you. We invite you into every situation that we have prayed for. Sickness, be gone. Illness, be gone. Amen. Death, be gone. Amen. Barrenness, be gone. Amen. Death, be gone. Amen. We invite you, Jesus. The works of darkness, be gone. Amen. Be gone, be gone, be gone. Be gone. Confusion of the mind, confusion of the spirit. Be gone, be gone. Satan, be gone, be gone, be gone. So shall it be. So shall it be. Acknowledge you. We acknowledge you, Lord. We acknowledge you. We acknowledge you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. And we 
in that spirit of, in that spirit of unity that's here we say our father who art in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen amen heavenly father we thank you thank you thank you lord we bless you thank you the works of satan are destroyed today we thank you for victory we thank you for your light we thank you that you continue to shine within us you will make us radiant radiant for you we bless you lord we thank you in jesus name we pray amen amen good morning everyone let's acknowledge and appreciate the the ministry of our young ones thank you for leading us in worship god bless you may the grace of the lord continue to be with you may you be light to this world God bless you, everyone. We have one little administrative thing to do. Oh, yeah, we are not administrative, but um, Grandma Pam is watching. Elder John is watching. If you don't mind looking at the camera there and just saying hello to them and saying, we we'll look forward to seeing you very soon. We have declared and decreed today. You are healed. Director, give us a long shot, please. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't give you extra warning. Yeah, thank you. You're, you're welcome into the house of the Lord. God bless you all. God bless you. God bless you. We have been looking at this month, Fill the Earth with Encouragers. Fill the Earth with Encouragers is our word for October 2024. It's part of our year of global influence 2024 for us is our year of global influence and this month specifically is a year uh, is a month to fill the earth with encouragers our anchor scripture comes from first corinthians 14 verse 3 and we'll read that together first corinthians 14 Verse 3. Thank you. One, two, go. But he who, who prophesies, prophesies speaks edification, edification and, and exhaltation and comfort, comfort to men. men. So we have been looking all through this month at this scripture. We first looked at the word edification. And last week, thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. We looked at the word exhortation. And today, uh, we'll move further to the word comfort. What is prophecy? What is prophecy? Does anybody want to help us to, to explain what his prophecy is? What is prophecy? I think the clue to defining prophecy is here. Uh, when we think about prophecy in the Old Testament, we think about initially a prophet. You, you, ter you, you try and call... Yes, those people who foretold what was to happen. When you say a prophet you immediately think, ah, somebody who will tell me what will happen to me in three years' time or next week when I go to that interview, the prophet will tell me, ah, you will see a man dressed in a black tie. When you see that man, you have to say to him, this is my job, give it to me. <laughs> um, 
that existed in the Old Testament. And we saw evidences of that where prophets will tell what it is to, what is to come. But Paul is saying something slightly different to that here. I don't know if we can start from verse 1. Let's just read verse 1 to 3 for context. He says here, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. But li listen to this, the next one. But especially that you may prophesy. You may prophesy. You may prophesy. So it's n that statement is not limiting it to only what we think to be prophets. It says, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Verse 3. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. So, who can edify? Who can exhort? Who can bring comfort to men? So, by doing that, you are already prophesying. By edifying, by exhorting, by bringing comfort, you are prophesying. But we said, we had looked at edification, we looked at, you know, building up and strengthening up. We looked at the word edify. Pastor looked at the word exhort last week. But today, let's look at comfort. And the title of our message today is Becoming Agents of Comfort in a Hurting World. We have already established the fact that we, we the children of God, have the office of prophesying. I.e. by edifying, by exhorting, and by bringing comfort. I'm looking at the word comfort. Again, we'll use it as a, we'll use a mnemonic of comfort to explain what comfort is. But as we're doing that, we, I want us to look at the life of Jesus because in everything that we do, we are to model ourselves to what he did here whilst he was on earth. He is the template that we follow. is the ultimate model of comfort Jesus is. And we will notice that as he went around, he was always seeking to comfort people. He was always seeking, seeking to make the situation that they were in better. He was always saying to them, the light is with you right now. So, we are also called to comfort like he did. So C, when we look at comfort, C-O-M-F-O-R-T, connect with compassion. Matthew 9, 36. Connect with people through compassion or with compassion. It says here, but when Jesus, when he saw the multitudes, he's talking about Jesus, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Notice the word compassion. When he saw the multitude, I mean, if you read that scripture all around, you will see that in their weariness <laughs> and being scattered, that was what he recognized. That was what he saw. As people are tired. Every time he decided to do a miracle, it was to help the people. It was to help them be better than they were. So in the same way, we are also called to connect with people through compassion. 
when you notice something and you see something incorrect or you notice that this is not right, don't leave it to the pastor. Don't leave it to the elders. We have been called, we, every one of us have been called to comfort the other people, those who are in need. So how do we do this? Take time to listen and show that you care. Comfort begins with letting others know that they are seen. That you notice what they are going through. People may not come up to you to tell you that they're going through something. But, you know, the countenance of somebody's face can tell you a lot. And see if what came up to me on Wednesday, Wednesday, and truly, I'd had a very long day. I, I had a very long day. And she said, your eyes are not showing that. I said, she said, how are you? I said, I'm fine, or something like that. I said, I'm good. She said, your eyes are not showing it. <laughs> you know, sometimes we, we, we put on a, a mask. People do. People put on a mask. But. In your relationship with them, go that extra mile and say, ah, I sense that your, as you said, ah, your eyes are not showing it. You know, and that, you know that little thing she said, it encouraged me. Somebody noticed that, yes, something is going on. And it, it kind of, bu it builds you up. It builds you up to say, wow, we are okay, yes. I can go further. I can go on more. Connect with compassion. Let people know that they are valued. Don't just walk on by. Oh. Offer hope through faith. Faith is one of the, when, when we looked at Edification and exhortation. You always see that faith is like, you know, the meandering river that goes. It's always, you will always find it there. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. John 14, 27. All of these things, we're looking at what Jesus did. And we'll look at how he comforted people. He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. It's a surety. Jesus said it. I believe it. He says he leaves peace with us. That peace is to comfort us. To know that we should not be troubled. We should not be afraid. Jesus didn't just recognize people's pain. He knew what he had to do to bring them out of that pain. And that's important. You know, we may not have all the answers. We may not be available all of the time. But when we are available, let us be available. Yeah? Yeah? We may not be there all of the time for everyone. But you know, when we recognize that all of us, all of us are called to prophesy, all of us are called to edify, all of us are called to exalt, all of us are called to comfort, then there is enough to go around. We don't rely on Pastor Owe all the time to say, oh, I need to talk to Pastor, you know. When people know that there are Christian brothers I can rely on, there are Christ it's a family. It's a family. It's a family. Don't let us mix the word comfort with sympathy. 
different things. Okay? They're totally different things. We're guiding people to hope. This is what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, here, he said, I'll leave my peace with you. It wasn't a pity party he was having here. No. He was giving them practical things. He was saying something practical to say, I, 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 I will leave my peace with you. Do not be troubled. Do not fear. And you know, as Christians, when somebody brings something to you, do you know the best way to help them? Prayer. Prayer. Thank you, Auntie Juliet. Aunt Juliet alluded to it this morning. Connect to God, and he will help the people. Don't say, uh, next time I see pastor, I will tell pastor. They've brought it to you. They've brought it to you. We're called to offer words of hope. Remind people of God's promises. You know, this book, this book and our connection to this book is what sets us apart from the whole world and our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is what makes things totally different. So when we go back to the book and we offer God's promises, we can offer people hope. Hope based on the word of God. We prayed today that there was healing. There's healing in the house. There's hope for healing. We're looking forward to it. Grandma Pam said to me this week, she said she'll be here, not this Sunday, next Sunday. And I prayed, we we prayed, and I said, yes, next Sunday, she'll be sitting there, by God's grace. And there's healing. We We know that there's healing. Because we have evidence of it in the book. So we trust God, that God will totally heal her. So John will be totally healed. He is totally healed by the grace of God. M. Meet needs practically. Meet needs practically. Mark 6. We'll start from verse 34. Let's take it at once. We'll go to 44. Let's, let's read one of uh, alternate verses. Uh, you start. When he came out, Thank you. saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was not now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Notice the scripture. This scripture here. This scripture here, I, I, I still struggle to understand what was going on in the minds of the disciples. But we do it every day. We too do it every day. Jesus was clear to them. It's, he said, you give them something to eat. And what do we know about the word of God? The word of God. He, I mean, he created the whole world. When he says, go and do something. There is something that is backing that word. There is something backing that word. Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. Notice the response they gave. If the disciples on that day had said, if one of them had said, everybody sit down, food come now. 
there would have been food. There would have been food. Because the word has gone. He said, you give them something to eat. Jesus wasn't just saying you give them something to eat because he didn't he, he, he knew there was supply already. He knew that there was supply. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? So, their minds was there was all they were already thinking about the, the 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 practicalities of it not working rather than the miracle that could happen do you understand do you see where i'm going they were thinking it is impossible so they were trying to explain away the instruction they were looking at logics You give them something to eat. That was the word is gone forth. God can say, you speak to them about him. You don't need to worry about what the doctor's report said yesterday. If God has said to you, yeah, go, pray. Pray with that person. Anoint them with all and then you go on your way. And then they start to explain. Next verse. But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Our God is a God of multiple chances. He won't force you. But what happened here was God realized that Jesus realized that if I start to explain to these people, Onga will, fin <laughs> will finish the people that have need. So he said, okay, tell me what you have. Tell me what you have. At least you have information. You, you are the, the guys that have the logic. Tell me what you have. Next verse, 39. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the open grass. 40. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he, demi he divided among them all. Again, something to learn here. He looked up to heaven, he blessed, it, he blessed it, and broke the loaves. Who did he give it to? Did he give it to the people? No, he gave it to the disciples. There's a miracle that's going to happen here, but you are also going to be agents of that miracle. So that you don't say, ah, it was when Jesus was here. So he did something and he went. So as they were given the food, they also noticed that ah, this thing is multiplying in our hands. They noticed it was multiplying in their hands. So they were agents. And that's what we're talking about. Being agents of comfort. So they all ate and were filled. Amen. 43. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. And lastly, 44. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. So their, me their needs were met practically. There was hunger. We can say the word of God is the bread of life. But if we had left them in the desert, just giving them the word of God, 
they could have died of hunger. But he gave practical food, energy for the bone. So whilst we're comforting people, there will be things that we have to do practically as well. There will be practical things. You might see somebody who is in need, might need a hospital appointment that they have to go to. They need a practical help, somebody to take them and bring them back. That's practical help. You're being agents of comfort. We have to be open to help practically. Whether it's providing a meal, lending a helping hand, or just spending time with someone. Just spending time. It might be a phone call, it might be a visit, but spend time with people. It's one of the most powerful sources of comfort. <laughs> exchanging time. Exchanging your time to help someone. It's very practical. So we've done C-O-M. Now F. Focus on encouragement, not judgment. When you're called to comfort others, don't focus on the judgment. Focus on how to encourage them. And th you say, what is the biblical uh, uh, um, basis of this? Let's look at John chapter 8. Well, it's again a long passage, but let's, let's persevere. We'll start from verse 1, and we're going to 12. Okay, I'll start. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. It continues, as we said, you know, the, sc the scroll is one long scroll we've divided. So for context, you'll have to go to John 7. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Okay. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, in the middle, in the middle, everybody gathering around, she was in the middle. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Mm. Now Moses in the law. Moses in the law. So, justifying what they were doing, commanded us that such should be stoned. Well, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Hmm? Remember, uh, before you say anything, don't forget the law. The law says this woman should be stoned. What do you say? Verse 6. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and rose from the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. Hmm. As though... He did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Mm -hmm. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, alone. And the woman standing in, still in the middle, she's still in the middle, in the midst. He was left alone. Ten. 
when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. And notice the next thing he said. Go and sin no more. Again, he gave the word. The word had gone. If she wanted to walk in that go, pastor has preached on the word go before. Um, many series on the word, just G-O. <laughs> that go. Go and sin no more. The word had gone forth. If she decided to walk in that word, she will sin no more. And lastly, verse 12. Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I wanted us to look at this one. After he had said to that woman, he then said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He provided comfort. He provided encouragement to the woman but he also said something profound that you know all those things that you've been seeing all those people that have been condemning you there's only one light and it is true jesus it was the light that came to shine on all of the darkness and that's why when we were praying this morning it was and we were we were prophesying this morning that Satan be gone, but Jesus, more of you. Because when light comes, darkness has to flee. In the song we said, we have a great, big, big, a large God. As God continues to be magnified in our lives, you know, the effects of the work of Satan just dispel. Darkness cannot stay where light is. Impossible. Not possible. He didn't judge. The law, the law provided what Jesus could have said. The law was already written. That anybody caught in the heart of, I mean, we could go, I mean, a lot of ink had been spilled around what Jesus was writing on the, on the ground. But the key thing, he chose not to judge. He chose not to judge. And we can also choose not to judge people. Jesus is our template. We can choose not to judge people. But encourage them to do right. Through the word. Yeah. We should encourage without judgment. Remember that comfort is about uplifting and not criticizing or pointing out flaws. Caning them with the the law. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're not, I'm not saying we condone bad things. We're not saying we condone error. We're not to condone. But you know, when com somebody, look at this woman, when she came, they already said she was causing order. Nobody offered to help her. Nobody offered to give her a way out. You know, the things... They forgot to bring the van. <laughs> because, yeah, it takes two to tango. Um, they, they, they were not offering her a way out of where she was. And this is, hap this is what happens all the time. When somebody comes to you with a problem, they already recognize that it is an issue. So, beating them with a cane is not going to solve the problem is offering practical solutions, offering comfort, and giving them the right thing to do according to the word of God. Uh, 
our second O. Open your heart to pray with them. And, you know, I dare say this is one of the most important ones. Prayer. Open your heart to pray. Don't have a, a closed mind about an issue. You know, we have, mis we, we have preconceptions. Hmm? We do. Unconscious bias exists. Whether we like it or not, it exists. If somebody keeps telling you, don't walk down that road because it's always, um, there's always robbery on that road. And every time they see you, they go, ah, don't walk down that road, don't walk down that road. The next time you find yourself in that area, you will do everything possible to avoid that road. <laughs> Even though it is not proven. We don't know. You haven't looked at the figures to actually say, oh, actually, no, this is not true. It's bias that happens. And it exists in everything that we see daily. The church will tell us, we would, the world will tell us that th some things are good and some things are, right, are bad. It is important that we base all of what we think on the word, on the scriptures. And most importantly, what the Holy Spirit leads us to do in a particular situation. Situations may be different. Two people might come to you with the same issue. Two people might come to you with, I don't know, we're already on adultery. It might be adultery, for example. The solution might not be the same thing. It might not be the same thing for those two different situations. We, gui we are guided to pray for them through the leading of the Spirit. Based on the Word of God. Based on the Word of God. So it goes back to that thing about total dependence on God. Yes, for every situation, seek what God is saying about this particular situation. What are you saying, Lord? How do we respond the right way to this situation? How do we respond? And how do we pray with them? Luke 22, verse 32. Jesus says, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. When you have returned to me, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren, strengthen your brothers. Because God has prayed for us. It's one of the most powerful tools we can bring, we can use to bring comfort to others. Praying with them and showing the way. Not just once. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you pray for them whilst they're there. You might pray for people in absentia when they're not there with you. Somebody brings something to your attention. You say, okay, we pray. But if God drops it into your spirit and you take it as we're supposed to stand in the gap, we pray. You know, you, sometimes you're going through the and somebody flashes through your mind. Pray. Just pray. Just say, Lord. You, you, yeah. So have an open mind. Don't underestimate the power of prayer. Offer to pray to those who are hurting and let them feel God's love and presence through prayer. That is key. Our Remind them of God's presence. Matthew 28, verse 20. We're talking about becoming agents of comfort in a hurting world. And this is a, a promise that Jesus gave us. So it's teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And this is the bit that we're going. And lo, I am with you always, 
always, even to the end of the age. God is always with us. I am with you always. Always. And again, when we're comforting people, it's an assurance that we, we say, God is present. God knows about this. It's, he knows what you are going through. And share scriptures like this. I am with you always. What more joy can somebody have when you're, when you're being comforted to say you're not alone in this situation. Jesus is with you. Invite him. Invite him daily. Gently remind others that God is with them in every moment. Share scriptures, personal testimonies. If you've gone through something, tell, tell other people. Let them know that whilst I was there, this was what God showed me. This was what, how God spoke to me. And that goes into the next one. T. Teach through your own testimony. When people come to you for comfort, draw on their own personal experiences. There's nothing wrong with that. Share about how God has helped you too. Second Corinthians 1, 3, 2, 7. Because God comforted us first. It's the way he comforts us. Uh, let's read the ultimate verses as well. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. He comforts us in our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Hmm. Okay. Five. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. It is for sal salvation and consolation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so you also, so also will you partake of the consolation. Be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. We were stopping at seven, so thank you. Thank you for the extra scripture. So, Paul was talking about being comforted and being agents of comfort. Verse 4. Verse 4. It says, Who comforts us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble, in any trouble, in any trouble, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So, it is okay to share your own testimony when you're comforting others. It is okay to extend what you have learned about God to others. To show people that yes, God is in that situation. No matter how dire, no matter how bleak it may look, he is in that situation. 
Yes. So be open to share your testimony. So we've done C-O-M-F-O-R, and then T is teaching. That's, that's teach through your own testimony. Be open to share. Let's look at one case study. Nah. There are many case studies about comfort, but we we'll use this one just to, ex just to explain or to show how you may be going through something, but in the midst of it, you know, everybody's going through something. In the midst of it, you can still comfort others. Let's look at Acts 16. Let's start from verse 16, if we can, just for context. We'll read together. Uh, we'll read in alternate verses. Um, let me start. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met her, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Mm -hmm. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. So, you might be doing the right thing and be persecuted. Yes? Okay. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Mm, okay. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes ah, and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Notice what is going through now to Paul and Silas, yeah? Verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. To keep them securely. What did they do? What did they do? They commanded <laughs> a spirit to come out of someone. Yeah? The right thing. And look, the, the magistrate tore off their clothes. <laughs> You can imagine what's going on in their minds. Uh, what did we do and what is, okay? They threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. 24. Oh, sorry. That was 23. Sorry, 23 was mine. Sorry. 23. Apologies. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Thank you. Next. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. It just gets worse. <laughs> but at, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Listen to what ne happened next. And the prisoners were listening to them. And the prisoners were listening to them. They were going through some stuff. They were going through heavy stuff, actually, for doing nothing. But notice that it didn't change their countenance. They knew, they, they knew what to do. That if we bring more of God into this situation, hmm? more light into this situation, darkness has to flee. 
And the prisoners were listening to them. Next. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. The response of my worship or the rock to the fire. Yeah. Were the response and a response to, to my, my worship. worship. So it was things started to move <laughs> were the response to their mm -hmm. worship. Mm -hmm. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. Have we done 26? We have. Let's do 27. And the keeper of the prison awaking from sleep and seeing that the prison doors open. Supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He was about to kill himself. <coughs> 28, your mm. turn. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. We're going to 34. Then he called for <laughs> a light. You see? He called for a light. Running and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. This were a few hours ago they were prisoners. The man then called for light to dispel darkness. And ran to Paul and Silas. 13. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They were beaten with rods a few hours ago. They were put in stocks. The person that was the head of what was the... They... They... they Paul and Silas didn't look for this man to kill himself. No. But they were looking for a way out for him. And they gave him the best gift they could give. In verse 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And they didn't stop there. You and your household So what more comfort they could, they, could they have brought to this man? 32. Then they spoke to the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and his family were baptized. So he received comfort. And what did he give back? He also gave back comfort. He washed their stripes. Now when he had brought them into his house, so it, do, it didn't stop from, he, he let them go and brought them into his house. He set food before them and he rejoiced. Having believed in God, with all his household. So we see how practical it is. Where even though we may be going through something. But Paul and Silas knew the thing to do. Invite God into the situation. They invited God. They got free. Then they not only stopped there. They helped the person that jailed them to find salvation in God. And that truly is the essence of it all. That whilst we're bringing comfort to people, where we're edifying, we're exhorting, and we're effectively prophesying for them, is for them to receive salvation and to know God better than they know him in the midst of the situation that they're in. 
That is the key. It's no more than that. Belief in God. Knowing that truly God, we are only agents. Pointing them to the Father. Pointing them to God. Pointing them to Jesus. We are agents. We are agents. So in a world that is hurting, we're called to bring comfort. Not just through words, but through genuine compassion. We're to support people. We're to encourage and share God's presence. That's what Paul and Silas did. They invited God's presence into that jail. And we see Jesus' examples to them. As Jesus went through, let us also be the hands and feet of Jesus as we go through the world. Helping people, bringing comfort wherever it's needed. It's a big task. But with God, it is easy. It will be easy. It's a high calling. It is a high calling. Bringing, prophesying, edifying, exhorting, and bringing comfort. It's a high calling. But we can do it. We can do it. So it starts from home, from the home. We talked about the workplace today. Thank you, Auntie Juliet. Yes, it can happen in the workplace. In our communities, when we meet people, when we talk to people, let us be the agents of transformation as God leads us. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We exalt your holy name. Thank you for the comfort that you give us. It is because we have received your comfort that we can also comfort others. Help us to be agents of your transforming love and your transforming forming comfort in this world. Teach us how to connect with people with compassion. Help us to offer hope. Let us meet people's needs practically. Help us to encourage and pray for others. And let us be always mindful to remind people that you are always there. Your word says, I am with you always. Help us, help us to always remember that. So we bring peace and comfort to every person we come into contact with. Help us. We thank you, Lord. We bless your holy name. Thank you for the worship here today because we know that, yes, truly, we invited your presence and you dwell in our midst. You dwell with us. Thank you. Thank you for all our services, or the children's church. Thank you for everything that's going up, going on upstairs. We thank you. We bless you for the teachers. We thank you. We bless you. We magnify you. Continue to give them wisdom wisdom far beyond we can even think of. Holy God, we bless you. We magnify you and we thank you for your goodness. You are worthy. Take all the praise, take all the honor, take all the adoration that belongs to you and to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. John's not here. <laughs> um, I think I've got the announcements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is anybody joining us for the very first time today? Oh, God bless you, sir. How are you? 
Welcome them in the name of the Lord. God bless you, sir. You are welcome in the name of the Lord. Oh, 